also as part of our uh, meeting, we get to do a market update every single week. So uh, this is uh, the market update for the week. Now I know we are on November the 2nd, but I do not yet have all of the October data yet. So usually the MLSs uh, give the realtors uh, uh, warnings, if you will, like, hey, it'd be really nice if that property that you sold like on October the 30th, if I don't know, if maybe you could just like put it in the MLS so that we could know what the heck happened because the early numbers always look terrible if you're looking at them uh, the first couple of days of the month because a lot of realtors have not yet put in their sales and most of the sales happen at the very end of the month. Uh, so typically here in Austin, we get our sales figures uh, come out somewhere. The final sales figures come out between the second and third week of the fall of this month. Uh, but the early uh, sales figures that I've seen from Austin Title actually show uh, the number of sales down about 20%, but the average price up about 25%. Now, as we get those final numbers in, my guess is the closed sales will be down year over year, maybe five to 8%, but the sales prices will still be up in that 25% range. So that's something to be aware of. Now, the forecast for 2021, and this is for all of Texas, and I'll uh, break down each of the major markets throughout Texas. And in addition to that, I'll specifically spend some time going through the Austin market as well. But the full year sales forecast, uh, we expect those sales to be up somewhere between 10 to 15%. Uh, year to date in Texas, they're up about 9%. Um, and for the sales prices, uh, we expect those to be up about 25% uh, versus where we were in 2020. So why are we expecting those sales prices to be up so much in uh, 2021 versus 2020? again no no covid what else what else a lot of people moving here what else cost of construction yes what else what else it's inventory it's inventory right um there's hardly any of it uh, in fact we got to a low um earlier this year of 0 0.6 months of inventory here in Austin. The historical average for Austin is about six months of inventory, six months of inventory. And what that means, let me just kind of break that down for you. Um, if we stopped listing houses today, based on the current buyer demand that we've had over the last year, am, am I boring you, sir? <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. We just got a big yawn in here. <laughs> she's talking about inventory. Oh, wake me up when she's done. Okay. I understand what's happening here. Okay. Okay. Uh, sir, we are not on Zoom. Uh, just, just, okay. Just want to, just want to remind you. I've lost my train of thought over that big yawn, but uh, six months of inventory. So what that means is if we stop listing houses today, um, based on the buyer demand that we've had over the last uh, 12 months, uh, this is this would indicate how long we would be in inventory before we were completely out of an inventory of homes for sale. So a typical market for us, the 40 year average is six months of inventory, meaning stop listing houses today. We have enough inventory to satisfy the buyer demand for six months. At in some point this year, the inventory has been a, as low as 0 0.6 months. This is basically a two two and a half week supply worth of inventory. So what that means again, if we stop listing houses today. In about two and a half weeks, we would be completely out of inventory of homes for sale. Now, it has gone up uh, here in Austin uh, and even throughout Texas, uh, but still uh, incredibly low, incredibly low versus uh, what, it's, what it is typically. And basic law of economics, basic law of supply and demand, as supply goes down, as demand goes up, prices just naturally rise up. Um, so some of the things that have made our inventory so low, uncertainty, uncertainty paralyzes people, right? No one says, hey, I think I'm about to lose my job. Let's go and sell our house and buy a new one, right? That's a rare thing. People get uncertain. They say, hey, let's just stay put and let's kind of possum this out and just hope that we don't get picked for, you know, a layoff or something. That's, that was the initial uh, thing that was going through people's minds uh, just a few, uh, just uh, 20 months ago, right? Now, a lot of that has changed over the last 20 months. In fact, now we are all on Zoom meetings all day long. And uh, a lot of people are thinking, gosh, I don't want, know if I wanna list my house right now because I don't have any place to go. 
Uh, I'm not going into work right now. I'm working from home and I don't have to disrupt my day, get out of my meetings because of all the people that might be coming in looking at my house. And are the potential buyers that are walking into my house, are they in good health uh, or not? Am I going to have to hand sanitize the entire house uh, when, someone leave, when someone leaves? And of course, the low interest rates are not just motivating the buyers that are in this market, but the low interest rates are also motivating the homeowners that are in the market to, to do what? To refinance. I'll ask you guys, how many of you did some sort of a home improvement project over the last 21 months, right? Okay, a couple of you guys, because your home is your sanctuary, and now you're there more than ever, and now you want to really make sure that that place looks really good. I did the same thing. I look out over my sanctuary every morning and realize that I get to live another day in this beautiful paradise. And I think a lot of homeowners have done the same thing. And instead of selling, they've just said, hey, let's refinance. Let's get a lower payment. And then we can use that money to do what? Use the savings to do what? To maybe make an addition, to maybe make some home improvements, or et cetera. Uh, the last market cycle has really changed how builders develop. So right now, banks are not letting builders get more than a certain number of lots um, out and permanent uh, because they don't want what happened in 2008 to happen again. So builders are even being um, handicapped by the number of lots that they can even start uh, through the banks. And it's not necessarily the banks, but I want to say it's like the CFIB. Uh, so this was all part of the Dodd-Frank legislation, uh, where it's basically uh, in 2008 when the markets really broke down because there were a lot of mistakes that were made. And uh, about three years after that happened, the government said, hey, we're from the government. We're here to help. And then they came out with all this legislation to make sure that none of what happened last time happened again. And I think it was you no know, capitalist, you know, areas. Yeah, we, we got that, right? So we're not going to let that happen. But they put all of these different uh, banking overlays to, uh, in some cases, stop builders from being able to build at the level that they're building. In fact, I think most builders right now, and you guys have to tell me because I know you guys are building, you don't even break ground until you have one earnest money contract and then five backup earnest money contracts, right? So that's a lot of what we're seeing right now with builders. If you take... Uh, if you go and look at a new build, new home community, there's not one that you can move in today, right? You have to get in line. You have to draw straws, right? So uh, that's what's that's one of the things that are happening today. Uh, labor shortages, immigration policies, border crossing insecurity, stopping would-be laborers and contractors uh, from getting here. In fact, I read recently that we had more arrests in 2021 at the border than we had had in any prior year. Now, I'm all about protecting our borders for sure, uh, but I do want to let in all the people that want to do all the jobs that we don't want to do and all the jobs that we definitely need done in order to build houses, and that's one of the things that's stopping us. Another issue that I'm seeing is, um, and this is, this is something that I grew up with, is when I was a, a young woman, I was told, you're going to go to college and I want you to get a white collar job and I don't want you to be a blue collar uh, uh, a worker, right? So what we're finding now is we're sending these kids to college, they're coming out with $100,000, $200,000 worth of debt and they're making $50,000 a year. Their payback on that debt is 20 years. It's like they basically got saddled with a house without the ability to have that appreciation. But when a plumber goes to plumber school, a technical school, they're in there for a year. And then after they're out, they're making a hundred grand a year, right? With no debt. Electrician, the same thing. HVAC tech, the same thing. So we have basically gotten ourselves out of a labor market that allows us to do what? Build houses. And is that going to change anytime soon? I don't think so. So what does that tell you about the supply going forward? It's going to continue to stay down. Uh, material shortage, uh, supply chain disruption. Uh, for those of you guys who are building already, you know all about that. Oh, the dishwasher I wanted or the windows I wanted are now another eight weeks out, right? So now you're uh, trying to deal with all of that as well. Prices have gone up for labor, materials, and land. City permitting. No one from the city is in here tonight. Just wanna, is that true? Just wanna, just wanna make sure. Yeah, okay. Um, you know, it's what I found most interesting. I'm on a soapbox tonight. Um, what I found most interesting is what does city council say? 
we need to make Austin more affordable, right? But then what does the permitting side of the city do? Fail you on every inspection. They hate your guts if you're a builder or an investor or a remodeler, right? They're trying to slow you down as much as possible. Is that roughly correct? Yes, yeah, that's, it's very challenging. You say things very euphemistically and I really love your perspective. <laughs> yeah. You can really make a good friendship with them. With the permitting and the inspectors. Yeah, yes, yes, yeah. So um, I still find that even very challenging. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, and it's like, is is it, the city is not this the city who says let's make things affordable is not that that the other part of the city that says let's go out and inspect and like fail people five times <clears throat> on something that's kind of you know ridiculous or something that you know anyway uh, soapbox uh, so city permitting and building codes have made houses more expensive as well uh, the Elon effect so Elon puts on a cowboy hat and says I'm a Texan now right. And then what happens? Everybody moves here. Uh, some homeowners want to keep their starter homes as uh, rental properties or Airbnbs. Institutional buyers. Do you guys know you're competing against institutional buyers? Yeah, you're competing against institutional buyers. You're comp competing against private equity. You're competing against hedge funds. One of my colleagues uh, here uh, told me that he was contacted by the Iceland uh, Pension Fund Committee. What? I'm competing against... People from Iceland, really? Like, no, I'm, I'm gonna melt that dude. Like, you know, it's like, no, but they're coming here. And, but what did Zillow just announce? What did Zillow just announce? They stopped buying houses. Oh no, they're, they're, the whole idea was that they were gonna buy and they were gonna resell them and they were gonna make a profit. As it turns out, Zillow, um, and this, so I read, I read several articles about it. As um, uh, Zillow in Arizona is losing, on average, twenty nine thousand dollars per house that they buy, and they have hundreds. Yeah, yeah, and and you know, but it's funny is, um, you, I think, sir, you mentioned something about evaluation, their valuations. These companies, I mean, it's like, how how crazy is this? Like, so many of these companies that have these billion dollar valuations lose millions and millions and millions of dollars like every single moment really right but they have these billion dollar value valuation so zillow has said hey we're getting out of the uh, house buying market because we're not it's not working out for us but the other i buyers open door redfin and some of the others are still in the market okay so that's that's who you're competing with as well uh, as a real estate investor and because the uh, zillow is losing about twenty nine thousand dollars per house does what does that tell you about what they're paying they're way overpaying. They're way overpaying. So guys, remember that when you compete with stupid, whether they have a billion dollar valuation or not, like they have somehow figured out how to afford losing $29,000 per property over about 300 properties in, in Arizona, right? That's where the article uh, was written that detailed that amount. Um, I, I don't know about you, but you guys, but I, I, I can't do that, right? So, um, but these are, these are our, they, these are a threat to inventory. These are a threat to us as real estate investors as well. Uh, many houses are still not going into foreclosure because to, uh, due to government policies. Now they're starting to, but, um, this, uh, the, the time over the 20 months or so that we shut down foreclosures for the most part, um, housing values have gone up somewhere between 25 and 50% for many of these people. So even if they, um, are behind uh, a year or two on their on their properties on their mortgages they might still have equity at this point so many of them are skipping the foreclosure process which was a big buying i used to call it my grocery list as a real estate investor so the grocery list's gotten a little slimmer these days uh, so you've got to look for other uh, opportunities and i know it feels like forever ago but the snow or ice storm realize that man you really love your plumber way more than you'd ever thought you'd ever known right uh, and uh, that took plumbers off the market, that took copper out of the market. So all of these things are obviously contributors to why this inventory is so sl so low right now. But for those of us who buy and hold, it's been a wonderful thing because for Texas, the average price was up 20% year over year last month. 
Uh, average sales price was three hundred and seventy thousand. Um, closed sales last month were down, but they were only down zero point seven percent, so just barely down. And remember that we were going against the floodgates that were still opening in September of 2020 after the lockdowns. Right now in Texas overall, we have a 1.6 month supply of inventory. The year to date sales price in Texas, uh, the year to date sales in Texas up 9% and the year to date average price up 20% versus where we were last year. Uh, Houston actually was the market who, that did the best last year, or part, pardon me, last month. Uh, the average price was up 13%. Their year over year sales in Houston were up. So it's the only market that saw up sales versus September of 2020. Those sales were up 1.5%. And in Houston, they have a 1.8 month supply of inventory. Year to date sales in Houston up 15.3% versus last year. Year to date average price up 18%. In San Antonio, gosh, this used to be like a super affordable place. Like you get houses, $150,000. Um, uh, gosh, I'm going to slap myself for uh, walking down memory lane right now. But uh, average price in San Antonio now 351000 up 15% year over year. Sales last month were flat um, at just over 3,600 sales. 1.3 months of inventory. Year-to-date sales in San Antonio up 8%. Year-to-date sales price up 16%. Uh, so again, performing really strong year-to-date. In Austin, uh, where we're at tonight, so average price, 564000 up 25% versus where it was the same time last year. And closed sales are down 5%. Uh, but again, the floodgates really opened when we're still very open in September of 2020. And I think that was around, was that around the time that um, Elon announced no, Elon announced this year that he was becoming a Texan. When did he announce that? I'm trying to remember when that was. Uh, but so we are also competing against that specifically here in Austin. Months of inventory right now at 1.1 month supply. Now, this sounds really low, but it's almost double what it was early er, earlier in the year, but still incredibly low. Pending sales are closest leading indicator to what closed sales will be next month, down 1%. Active listings, um, this is some this is a phenomenon that is probably one of the rarest phenomena um i've ever seen and i've only seen it over about the last six months so uh, especially if you're dealing with buyers this is something great to explain to them especially if they're new to this austin market and they're like i don't want to you know go into a multiple offer situation i don't want to pay above list price well that's the only way you're going to get a property right so here's what i want to point out uh the total number of active listings is almost exactly the same as the total number of closed sales and is almost exactly the same as the number of pending listings. Typically active listings are somewhere between three and five or more X what closed sales and what pending sales are. So what does that tell you? Literally um, every house that goes on the MLS is sold within one point right now, 1.1 months, right? So everything that's out there is getting sold right away. The closed sales year to date um, up 6.4% versus last year and the average price up 32%. And the largest market here in Texas, Dallas, the sales price was up to 415,000, up 18% year over year. The number of closed sales were down 3%, but we're still almost 11,000. Year to date sales in Dallas are flat. Uh, so all the other markets are up and up pretty significantly, but the year to date price is up 22%. So again, just to kind of be clear on what we're saying here on why you're seeing some of those total sales, the volume numbers down, uh, just to really be clear and understand why that is, is again, throughout Texas, single family home sales ended a multi-month positive run with a 9.4% drop in July of 2020. The number rebounded back in August of 2021 with sales up 1% versus August of 2020. This number was barely down in September with sales down 0.7% versus August of 2020. The decline was the result of the worldwide disruption where we were all in lockdown. And once we got out of lockdown, everyone decided that it's time to buy a house. So that's going to be affecting us probably throughout uh, the rest of the year. But remember, the total sales through the year are up 9%. So that is the market update. And every uh, week we do a market update with the closed sales from the prior month. So we should have the October sales, uh, I'm sorry, the, we should have the October sales right around November the 15th. So check back with us because we update that as soon as it comes in. 
And guys, I want to make a very special announcement before we go into the strategy portion of our presentation tonight. And that is um, how we've changed how we do the Real Estate Investor Association. We've changed how we deliver knowledge to you guys. So the way that we used to, to uh, deliver knowledge is we'd say, hey, come back every month. We get together. We talk about real estate. We share tribal knowledge. We give tips. Um, we uh, uh, give you best practices so you can build your business. And that's wonderful, right? Sharing best practices over three hours. And then you're like, all right, three hours, just not probably enough to really get ultimately where you want to go. And it would take you somewhere between a year and three years to get all of the knowledge out of the Real Estate Investor Association because it takes at least 24 hours to really download all of this stuff. Think of it as like taking uh, a full load in, and or a full uh, college class. So what we've done is instead of saying, hey, come back every month, we are uh, organizing the Real Estate Investor Association, how we deliver knowledge and how we deliver the training and the course of tonight, as well as a workshop that we've got coming up. So in the workshop, we'll talk about the different strategies that we've used. So we've shared one tonight in terms of our tip of the week, which was how to get past that investor glass ceiling so you can ultimately buy more properties. So we'll go through the 12 investing strategies that we've been using over the last almost two decades uh, that have allowed us to not have to update our resume, go to work for anyone else, uh, and have that life of stress-free abundance. We'll also talk about the marketing strategies that we use. So I told you guys that on average, houses on the Austin MLS are selling for 107% of the list price. So what does that tell you? Your deals are not on the MLS. Now back in 2003, Yes, they were. Back in 2010, yes, they were. But now they are not. So you've got to understand different ways, new ways to be able to find off-market deals. Uh, so we'll share that with you as well as the 10 closing scripts. So if you are unsure about what questions to ask, what to say, what objections you get as a real estate investor when you're trying to put a, market, a property under contract that's off-market, uh, we've had those conversations thousands of times. So we have built the scripts, what we call the exactly what to say for the real estate investor that allow properties under contract, close deals, and ultimately uh, build your real estate investing business. So what we are doing right now is we're offering this workshop for free. So we're doing this and we've been doing this for about the last 21 months. So ever since this is we're living through started. So we're doing this uh, only probably through the end of 2021. So I want to make sure you guys get signed up for the next workshop that we have. You can get signed up at TexasStarterKit.com. We've got a QR code on there as well. Our next Austin workshop is going to be November 12th, 13th, and 14th. You guys can join live in Austin. We also have one in Dallas as well as in Houston. And again, you can get signed up at TexasStarterKit.com. We're doing it both live as well as simulcast online via Zoom. So if you're working on Friday and you want to have two uh, screens in front of you, I, I know who you are. Um, you're welcome to do that. And if you want to just join us live and in person, you're welcome to do that as well. So these are the dates that we've got coming up. Uh, Austin, the next date, November 12th, 13th, and 14th. You can get signed up at TexasStarterKit.com or you can uh, pull out your phone and use this QR code. Now, most of you guys are used to this when it comes to ordering uh, food. So this does not come with uh, nachos or uh, uh, beverages, but it comes with your ability to order as many food and beverages as you want. I'll tell you, I was talking to a real estate investor who joined our association, um, gosh, probably about four years ago. And, and she said, you know, Shanoa, I want to tell you that I almost did not come to your meeting. And I'm like, why not? And she said, well, because you didn't serve any food. But your meeting was the best meeting that I went to. And, and I said, you know, I've heard that from a lot of investors that they, um, they're sick of going to places where it's about cheap beer and, and chicken wings, right? I don't know about you guys. I don't need cheap beer and chicken wings. I can afford my own food. Uh, what I want is knowledge. What I want is information. What I want is the tribe. So i uh, love to have you guys join us. Uh, again, just go to texasstarterkit.com, click on the QR code. And then I also want to go ahead